เอ้ากุจต้องตุนุนเรศประกาศมันโตประจำรายการในที่สัมมาคาอินดังประดอลบิดาจุนตือมันทราบปีนี้ดำไปมันโตกับเพื่อในสันทานจบกิจพิสัยดินดาวระบบคลุนสมจริงท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ชมครับท่านผู้ On the 22nd of November 2011, at the very start of this trial, Nguyen Chia admitted in this courtroom that the decision to evacuate Phnom Penh and other Cambodian cities was made at a meeting of the party leaders held in mid-1974. He described in detail the agenda of the meeting and stated as follows. I quote, The meeting made the following decision unanimously. One, in case Phnom Penh is liberated, we have to evacuate the people from Phnom Penh and from city centres centers temporarily in order to analyse the situation for a period of time, in particular to analyse the actual attitude of Vietnam. Nguyen Chia initially described this meeting as an extraordinary session of the Standing Committee and later clarified during questioning by Judge Laverne that it was a meeting of the Standing Committee and members of the Central Committee that decided in mid-1974 to evacuate people from Phnom Penh and other provincial towns. The meeting described by Nguyen Chia is referenced in a number of issues of the revolutionary flag. The September 1977 issue of the party publication, a speech that was given by Pol Pot on the occasion of the 17th anniversary of the CPK, refers to a June 1974 meeting of the party centre that I quote, resolved to mount a decisive offensive to liberate Phnom Penh and the entire country, unquote. Your Honours will recall that Steve Hedder stated during his testimony that the Khmer original this revolutionary flag describes this as a meeting of the party centre or Mocham Pak. It does not say Central Committee, as some translations suggest. So this meeting of the CPK leaders that decided to evacuate Phnom Penh was neither a meeting of the Standing Committee nor a meeting of the Central Committee. That leads me to a question of critical importance for this chamber to decide who was present at this meeting. We know from his admission and testimony during this trial that Nguyen Chia was one of the party leaders present at this meeting. Who were the other party leaders who met in June or mid-1974 and unanimously decided to evacuate Phnom Penh? 
question was provided to your honours by P. Pong, who at the time was Pol Pot's bodyguard and he was present at the meeting. P. Pong recalled that it took place in the rainy season in 1974, in June or July. He testified that the meeting lasted more than two weeks that it took place in the party office in Mia village in Stung Trang district and that was, it was attended by fewer participants than a prior party congress he had witnessed. Most importantly, Pipon specifically identified the group of CPK, CPK leaders that attended the meeting. He testified that Pol Pot was there, that Nguyen Chia was there, that Yang Sari was there, and that Kyu Sampan was there. He also saw Sao Pim, Khoi Ton, Ta Mok, Vaughan Vet, Ross Nim, and Son Sen at that meeting. Pipon's testimony that Q Sampan was present for the meeting of the CPK leaders held at the meet office in June or July 1974 is corroborated by a number of other sources. Your Honours may recall that Yang Sari and Q Sampan had been on a trip abroad in the preceding months, visiting a number of countries in Eastern Europe and Africa. They returned from that trip to Beijing on the 20th of May 1974, flew to Hanoi on the 27th of May 1974, and by June 1974 were back in Cambodia. The timing of their return from this trip is confirmed by contemporaneous press reports uh, diplomatic cables and the testimony of Song Sukun and Nuam Sem, who are part of the delegation that travelled with Kyu Sampan and Yang Sari. Pipon's testimony is further corroborated by the statements of Yang Sari, who admitted both that he returned to Cambodia from abroad in 1974. He had discussions with Pol Pot about the evacuation of Phnom Penh. Thus, Your Honours, there is no evidence placing Q Sampan anywhere else but in Cambodia at the material time, continuing his close cooperation and fellowship with the other senior leaders. In fact, Your Honours, Q Sampan's presence at the location of the June 1974 meeting in Miak Village is also proven by the testimony of his own wife, who places her husband at the location of the meeting in the month of June 1974. So Sachia told this court that she was at the Miak office, and I quote, during my early days after giving birth to my first child, unquote. She also told the chamber that their son was born on the 4th of May 1974, that Q Sampan was out of the country at the time, and she, that she gave birth, and that about a month later he returned. On Friday, Your Honours, I took you through a series of lies and evasive answers given by Nguyen Chia during this trial whenever he was questioned about Q Sampan. One of those lies was an attempt to protect his fellow accused by claiming that neither Yang Sari nor Q Sampan was present at the meeting. Yang Sari himself has refuted Nguyen Chia's assertion. Uh, and for the reasons I discussed earlier, this chamber cannot give any credibility to Nguyen Chia's attempt to distance Q Sampan from this matter. Your Honours, the June 1974 meeting was just the first of a series of meetings that these accused, accused participated in relating to the plan to evacuate Phnom Penh and other cities. Nguyen Chia and Q Sampan also participated in a meeting held in early April 1975 at the B-5 command base in Pien Commune, Kampong Chang province. 
at which the final plans for the capture and evacuation of Phnom Penh were discussed and agreed to by the CPK leaders. On Friday, I talked about the role of the B-5 base and the admissions of both Q Sampan and Nguyen Chia that they were at the party's forward bases west of Udon in Ping Commune in the weeks preceding the 17th of April 1975. Q Sampan specifically admits that he had moved to this location by the end of March 1975. Nguyen Chia admits that he was at B5 in April 1975 and that the subject under discussion of B5 was principally the liberation and subsequent evacuation of Phnom Penh. Also on Friday, we saw the film of Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia and Kyu Sampan together looking at maps of the B-5 command base. And Your Honours will remember the testimony of P. Pon describing the April 75 meeting at B-5. It was attended by almost the exact same group of leaders as the June 1974 meeting. Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia, Q Sampan, Tai Mok, Sun Sen, Koi Ton, Vaughan Vet, and Sao Pim. Pipon testified to this chamber that the party leaders present at this meeting discussed and approved the evacuation plan. He also specifically described what he heard Nguyen Chia and Q Sampan say at this meeting. And I quote, I noted that Um Nguyen Chia was on his feet and raised this first. He said that it was necessary and needed approval, and it evacuation was noted to be necessary, and he expressed his position that he agreed with the plan. Question. What about Mr. Q. Sampan? Did he say anything before he approved the plan? Answer. Om Q. Sampan also agreed with the plan, and the whole meeting applauded and approved the idea. Unquote. Like the June 1974 meeting, and consistent with the collective decision-making procedure that I discussed on Friday, the decision in the April 1975 meeting was unanimous. Pipon testified that the meeting dealt with, I quote, both the military measures as well as the evacuation measures, unquote. He also described the discussion by the CPK leaders at the meeting concerning the reason for the evacuation of the cities. And he stated, I quote, before we liberated Phnom Penh, we had liberated some other provincial towns, and people who engaged in the battlefields shared their opinion, and they said that if people remained in the cities, the parties would find it difficult to control them because they had been there for long, so it would not be easy for the cadres to manage them. So they had to be evacuated so that they could easily conquer the cities." Your Honours, Pipon specifically identified Nguyen Chia as one of the people who spoke at the B-5 meeting about the experiences of evacuating other cities stating that Nguyen Chia referred to the liberation of other towns and cities as, I quote, experiments, unquote. No one at this meeting expressed any concerns about the problems associated with evacuating the entire population of a city as large as Phnom Penh. Your Honours heard the submissions of my colleague, Ms. Chia Liang, about the CPK's practice of ruthlessly evicting all residents from cities and towns they captured in the 1973 to the 1975 period. P. Pon confirmed that it was largely based on the party's experiences with cities such as Udon that the CPK leaders determined they would also evacuate Phnom Penh. 
He was at study sessions where he heard both Nguyen Chia and Khieu San Pan discuss the experiences from Udon and the CPK practice of evacuating cities and towns as they were captured. At those study sessions, Nguyen Chia and Khieu San Pan explained that the purpose of the evacuations was twofold. One, first to foil any attempt by the enemy to destabilise our forces, and two, second, to prevent cadres from being politically and ideologically corrupted by the urban population." Unquote. Your Honour, this evidence goes to the very heart of this case. It proves the shared intent and knowledge of the accused and their agreement with a common plan relating to the forced transfer of the populations of Cambodian cities with full awareness of the crimes that were certain to result from these orders. It also proves that the decision to evacuate Phnom Penh had nothing to do with the food situation. It had nothing to do with the threat of American bombing. It was a strategy used by the CPK leaders to control the people, to force them into cooperatives and to flush out enemies. It was part of the broader joint criminal enterprise proven by the evidence before this chamber to treat the population of Cambodia as the property of the CPK to enslave them in an oppressive system of forced labour cooperatives and work sites where they would work without payment in inhumane conditions and denied even the most basic individual rights. It was part of the plan to persecute and to eliminate, it, eliminate targeted groups of perceived political enemies, particularly officials and military officers of the Khmer Republic, but also the educated, the religious, all minorities and those ties to other countries. The accused participation in and contribution to this criminal plan continued throughout the DK period. In May 1975, Nguyen Chia and Khieu San Pan were part of the group of CPK leaders who determined that the evacuation of people from cities was to be permanent. Khieu San Pan has admitted that many complicated problems arose as a result of the evacuation and that the Central Committee and Standing Committee continued to address and decide issues relating to the evacuees on an ongoing basis. In addition to their participation in the meetings that unanimously decided to evacuate Phnom Penh, there is substantial evidence of other acts, conduct and statements by the accused that prove their membership and contribution to the CPK's criminal plans for the evacuation of Phnom Penh and other cities. Both Nguyen Chia and Khieu San Pan were part of the group of CPK leaders who oversaw and commanded the final attack on Phnom Penh and the evacuation of its residents from the party's forward bases west of Udon. On Friday, I discussed the evidence proving the party centre's effective control and command of the zones and the CPK military forces, including in the weeks immediately preceding and following the 17th of April. 1975. For at least the first three days of the evacuation, and possibly as long as a week, Nguyen Chia and Khieu San Pan were at the party's forward command base with Pol Pot, Sun Sen and the leaders of the four zones whose forces were carrying out the evacuation of Phnom Penh, Sao Pim, Ta Mok, Khoi Ton and Von Vet. Your Honours, this group of leaders are essentially the same people who were publicly identified in 1972 by the National United Front for Kampuchea as the high command of the resistance army, the Cambodian people's National Liberation Armed Forces. 
In an article of the Vietnam Courier, which reports as of the 23rd of March 1972, an announcement by the AKI, which is the Information Bureau of Funk, they identified the members of the High Command of the CPN LAF as follows. Chairman Q Sampan, Commander-in-Chief of the National Liberation People's Armed Forces of Cambodia, Vice-Chairman Salos Sa, Pol Pot, Head of Military Leadership of the Army, Vice-Chairman Nguyen Chia, Head of the Political Leadership of the Army, Vice-Chairman so Vana, known more commonly to us by his alias Sao Pin, Deputy Head of the Military Leadership of the Army, Member Chi Chun, known to most by his alias Ta Mok, and Head of the Logistic Department and Member Sun Sen, Chief of General Staff. Your Honours, it's not a coincidence that these six men were all present at the early April 1975 meeting at the B-5 site approving the final plans for the evacuation of Phnom Penh. And it's not a coincidence that these six men remained at the party's forward command base in April through the final attack on Phnom Penh and the days that immediately followed. Nguyen Chia and Q Sampan were part of a small group of senior party leaders who controlled and commanded the CPK forces during the evacuation. They were informed by radio communication and telegrams of all situations in the battlefields and any problems or issues faced by troops during the evacuation. They made the decisions and the CPK K forces carried out their orders. While Q Sampan claims that he had no significant role at B5 or the other party bases, the evidence you heard in this trial has proven that, in fact, he was one of the most senior leaders and actively contributed to the military effort behind the evacuation. You will recall two CPK cadres who were present at the B-5 base testify and both confirmed Q Sampan's active participation and contribution. Saloth Ban, alias So Hong, the nephew and then bodyguard of Pol Pot, witnessed Q Sampan attend a meeting at Pol Pot's office in Pien Commune before the attack on Phnom Penh and assist in making a list of required ammunition. And in addition to his testimony, that Q Sampan was one of the CPK leaders who approved the final evacuation plans. Pipon also testified that while he was at B5, he delivered messages between Q Sampan and the battlefields. The regiment and battalion commanders who entered Phnom Penh on the 17th of April 1975 knew both that the party leaders were nearby and that they were responsible for deciding matters of importance. We heard an important example of this during my colleague's presentation last week when the CPK military commander, the Ministry of Information, was asked by Sidney Schumberg and other reporters what was to happen to the Lon Nol officials who had gathered at that location on the 17th of April 1975. His response was, was, that, was that the top leaders, top political leaders, were not far from the city and they are the ones who would decide. Two of those leaders are the accused on trial in this courtroom today, and the evidence has shown exactly how they decided this question. They decided to eliminate, to smash these officials, and the evidence of their decision is the widespread killings of these officials in Phnom Penh, along the evacuation routes, and throughout the country, including at Tulpol Tre, which my colleague, Ms. Liang, detailed in her submissions. Nguyen Chia and Q Sampan were key members 
and made key contributions to the decision to eliminate the law law officers and officials and they bear criminal responsibility for those events. Nguyen Chia also contributed to these crimes through his participation in the development of the party's political and strategic line, including the use of revolutionary violence against civilians, the view that the party's enemies were concentrated in the cities, and the determination that the countryside would be the support base of the party, the base from which the CPK would attack, encircle and suffocate the capitalist cities. Notwithstanding Nguyen Chia's protest that he was not an intellectual, Nguyen Chia's written closing submission still admits his role in formulating and developing CPK policy. Two key speeches given by Nguyen Chia during the DKP period also evidence his agreement with the CPK plans and policies that were carried out during the evacuation of Phnom Penh. In a speech he made to the Revolutionary Army of Kampuchea in January 1977, Nguyen Chia cited the evacuations of Udong, Banam and other cities as examples of the party's important strategic line to control the people and seize the people. He described how, quote, we took everyone in Banam town, expelling the ethnic Vietnamese, the ethnic Chinese, the military. We took everyone, drying up the people from the enemy, unquote. And Nguyen Chia made clear his approval of an agreement with the party line. And I quote, our line was to fight to seize the people. One, we took him. Two, we took them. Hundred, we took them. Thousand we took them, and so on, until we fought for and seized the people from Phnom Penh too. The line of drying up the people from the enemy was very correct, Your Honours, and also, in a June 1978 speech to a delegation from the Danish Communist Party, Nguyen Chia further confirmed his knowledge of an agreement with the true purpose of the evacuation of Cambodian cities, namely to flush out and eliminate enemies. In that speech, Nguyen Chia expressly noted there were many enemies in the city and stated that the reason for the evacuation was to smash an enemy plan to resist or overthrow. For his part, Q Sam Han also gave speeches and statements proving his contribution to an agreement with the plan to forcibly evacuate Phnom Penh and to search out and execute Khmer Republic officials and other enemies of the CPK. As a public leader of the resistance and the commander-in-chief of the CPNLAF, Q Sampan frequently issued statements supporting and directing the attacks on Phnom Penh, as well as statements that openly encouraged the killing of Khmer Republic officials and the commission of crimes against the civilian residents of Phnom Penh. In a January 1973 statement, he boasted how on the Svartsfabe Prey battlefield along National Road Number no. Two alone. Quote, we have smashed the enemy's ten strategic villages. In April 1974, shortly after the city of Udon had been forcibly evacuated and scores of Khmer Republic officers rounded up and executed, Q Sampan praised the elimination of I quote 5,000 enemies. Unquote and the annihilation of the Khmer Republic's, quote, puppet soldiers at Udon, 
and described Phnom Penh as the last hideout of the traitors. It was Q Sampan who announced the start of the final offensive against Phnom Penh on the 31st of December 1974, calling on all troops and cadres to, I quote, launch the most vigorous and most powerful offensive against the enemy, unquote, in Phnom Penh and other cities. In the months leading up to the 17th of April 1975, Q Sampan described Phnom Penh as the enemy's, I quote, last den, unquote. He implored cadres to, I quote, sweep the enemy pacification activities from the entire liberated zone, unquote. He praised the shelling of Phnom Penh by our forces, most active artillery attacks. He rejected negotiations that could have peacefully ended the war and avoided the attack on Phnom Penh and supported the strangulation of Phnom Penh through a military These statements reveal Q Sampan's intent to target the residents of Phnom Penh and instigation of violence Some against these people, who the party viewed as politically suspect. They de demonstrate his key role in the party centre and his embrace of the use of violence against the population of Phnom Penh. They were not the words of a commander of nothing. They were the words of a man who accepted his role as a leader of the communist resistance and active and absolutely committed participate in the CPK plans and agenda. Your Honours, on the 22nd of April 1975, five days after the forced evacuation had started, Q Sam Khan spoke on Phnom Penh Radio, and I quote, This is our nation's and people's greatest historic victory. It has opened the most brilliant and righteous path which led the Cambodian people and the CPN LAS in waging the powerful people's war to fight the enemy on every field, successively smashing all enemy maneuvers, relentlessly attacking and draining the enemy of all of its military, political, economic and financial strength. Food and rice until it reached a point from which it could not recover. Finally, the enemy died in agony, unquote. One of these words are extremely important. They evidence without a shred of doubt Q Sampan's support for the CPK policies that were then been implemented. The fall of Phnom Penh and the evacuations were, I quote, the greatest historic victory, quote. He spoke these words at a point in time when he knew, by his own admission, that the forced evacuations of millions of people were in progress. Your Honours, we now turn to the specific crimes which the accused are charged in this first force movement. It is clear that the force transfer itself was a crime against humanity. Nguyen Chia and Q Sampan planned and ordered the removal of millions of people from their lawful residence in Phnom Penh without permissible grounds and did not allow them to return to their homes for the whole time that they were in power. As discussed by my colleague, the evidence does not establish any legitimate basis under international law for the CPK to forcibly evacuate the entire city of Phnom Penh, let alone the other cities of Cambodia. The conditions that were inflicted upon the population in that transfer inhumane acts against their human dignity. It's a crime against humanity to send millions of people out into the hot countryside to walk for days, weeks and sometimes months without any organised transportation or any provision of food, water or medical assistance. The accused was certainly aware of the inhuman conditions faced by the evacuees sent out of the cities into the countryside. The evacuation was still in progress when Nguyen Chia and Kusampan travelled from Udong to Phnom Penh 
ban cầm phong đại thừa lái nông phê đang nguyên chiên nông phê sầm phón quân nam phê ở đông tây nông phê quốc kế ban tân tổ này nông ca chuẩn bị hoàn toàn không chỉ cả bất tây nguyên chiên ban điệp rộp tuần thế sầm ban nở vây quanh ban sơn quốc nông phê đại quan thôi làm nào tới tây nông phê chúng đại tây ban điệp lý đa tạm lấy mưa tới đại lãng nông ở không nào thời chuột bắt đầu thay nông phê đỏ cọ cọ nông phê thôi làm nào the residents were never allowed to yeah. return to the city or their homes during that three and a half year period. The homes of many of the evacuees were looted and destroyed. This was a criminal act from start to finish, and the accused have no plausible argument that would justify the permanent emptying out of all the cities in Cambodia. With respect to their responsibility for extermination and murder, Nguyen Chia admitted in this court hearing that the decision and order of the party leaders was that all residents of Phnom Penh would be required to leave the city including the sick, the elderly, and hospital patients, as well as the very young. There would be no exceptions. The accused and other CPK leaders knew that death on a massive scale were inevitable when they decided to force the sick, the elderly, the pregnant women, the newborn children to march into the Cambodian countryside during the hottest month of the year without adequate provision for food and water and You've heard the evidence of the people who died during this forced movement. Even the CPK leaders themselves have admitted to knowledge of thousands of deaths. Q. Sampan told the co-investigating judges that he was aware of the likelihood of death on a mass scale during the forced transfer, stating, and I quote, pertaining to the evacuation of Phnom Penh, I clearly realised the population might have fallen along the way, unquote. In one of the video clips we played on Friday, Q. Sampan admitted that many people died when the evacuation was carried out. Yang Sari, in what would have be called a gross understatement, described the first month's deliberation as, quote, quite tough, and admitted that 2,000 to 3,000 people died during the evacuation of Phnom Penh, and several thousands died at the paddy fields. Ying Turret estimated that 20,000 people died from hunger and illness in 1975 as a result of the CPK policies. With respect to killing the killings of Lon Nol officials during the evacuation, you have seen many times how now the execution order that was issued by Q. Sampan in February 1975, and you have heard and seen Nguyen Chia on video admit that the political leadership ordered the liquidation of the top Khmer Republic leaders. You have heard, have heard testimony from eyewitnesses who were present when Long Beret surrendered to CPK forces at the Ministry of Information, and when Surik Mittag and other government officials were forced by the CPK to leave the French embassy. Yang Sari admitted the executions of Long Beret, Surik Mittag and Long Nol at a press, press conference late in 1975. Your Honours, Q. Sampan and Nguyen Chia's responsibility for the mayor, murder of Khmer Republic officials during the evacuation of Phnom Penh has been proven beyond reasonable I will address later their responsibility for other executions of Khmer Republic soldiers and officials when I discuss the Tulpa Trey crime site. Prosecutors have proven beyond a reasonable doubt these two accused are guilty of crimes against humanity in relation to the forced movement of the population from Phnom Penh. I'll now turn to the second forced transfer.
My colleague, Ms Chia Liang, has made detailed submissions on the planning and execution of these crimes. I'll be making reference to some of the party centre documents which she addressed. They established in our submission that, like the evacuation of the cities and the executions of Khmer Republic officials, the second forced transfer of the population, which commenced in September 1975, was the direct result of the decision by the CPK leadership, including Nguyen Chia and Kisampan. My colleague in her submission stated on the 17th of April 1975, the CPK leaders established the first slave state. Every aspect of that slave state was run and operated under the watchful eye of the CPK center. The CPK slave state operated as an ongoing and continuous criminal system persecution, enslavement, forced transfer, forced labour, human treatment and murder direct, directed primarily at the new people, and that continued until the 7th of January 1979. All crimes committed in the course of this enslavement system were designed, organised and supervised by Nguyen Chia, Q San Pan and their co-perpetrators. These crimes were organized and executed through a rigid and strict hierarchy, a hierarchy in which cadres and military forces received their orders from and were ultimately answerable to the party center. This is established by the extensive evidence of reporting lines and communications which I addressed last week. It also confirmed by expert evidence. In his testimony, Professor Chandler described the CP CPK structure as a pyramid with all orders emanating from the top. At the top of the slave state was the collective leadership, the party centre, which Professor Chandler testified included both Nguyen at the bottom of the pyramid, slaves, the new people who had been expelled from their homes, stripped of their rights, and subjected to the CPK's rule of terror, confirming the fact that this system of enslavement was centrally devised and coordinated from the top of the CPK, Expert witness Philip Short testified as follows. It did emanate from the top, it could only have emanated from the top because the underlying principles were the same everywhere. Everyone, well, the overwhelming majority, because there was always a tiny group who were exceptions for one reason or another, the leaders, those high up in the party, certain very privileged workers had a greater degree of freedom and so on. But the Really, 99% of the population, the overwhelming mass, were all slaves, in the sense that they had no choice over any aspect of their, of their lives." Unquote. In our respectful submission, everything that followed from the 17th of April 1975 was part of this system of enslavement. The second forced transfer was simply a continuation in the implementation of the system. This is not the first forced movement of the population. And it certainly was not the last. The CPK system of forced labour and forced transfers was in operation throughout their period in power. Whenever the leaders decided that the enslavement program needed people to be in a certain area, they moved them by force, thereby instituting another episode in the ongoing persecution and mistreatment of the new people, the people from Phnom Penh. Within that broader system, the second force transfer was implemented pursuant to a series of key decisions made by the senior leaders between May and September 1975. As my colleague demonstrated, in May 1975, the leaders met at the Silver Pagoda for a period of 10 days. Both Nguyen Chia and Khu San Pan attended that meeting. The meeting determined that all CPK zones 
Must confine evacuees within cooperatives where they will be subjected to a system of forced labour. As Kusampan testified before you, the imperative was to outrun Vietnam. This imperative defending the country against an imaginary threat was based on the CPK leader's paranoia about being dominated by the Communist Party of Vietnam. Do not believe the defense when they say this was a program designed to empower the people and lift their living standards. This program was pursued through crimes, including slavery, forced labor, forced transfer and murder. This criminal program was grounded in the CPK's leaders' determination that they, and only they, were the masters of each and every life in this country. They implemented their criminal program out of brutality. They decided on who lived and who died. They decided where and how their slaves lived, how much they were allowed to eat, how much forced labour they were required to perform, and even what they were allowed to think. The people were reduced to dispensable, worthless objects, showing opposition was equal to certain death. They even formalized, formalized this by delegating the right to smash inside and outside the ranks to those under their supervision. In her submission, as my colleague discussed the August 1975 Standing Committee visit to the North West Side. This document contains the Standing Committee's determination that 400,000 to 500,000 people must be moved to the North West. It records a fact-finding mission, a mission to examine the state of the enslavement program in the North The document shows how closely the leaders kept themselves informed of the situation in the zones. In this document, the leaders demonstrate without ambiguity that the evacuees have no freedom of movement. They state that good cadres are those who control the people in cooperatives so that they are unable to move freely. And I quote, The authorities have managed to control the average people, but in particular, in some places, it has been observed that where there are good leadership cadres, poor leadership, and people are stable, and where there are no cadres, poor leadership is not stable and does not work smoothly. People move about freely. So, freedom of movement is a sign of poor leadership by the local cadres. The leaders also acknowledge at the very start of the document that serious shortages are afflicting the new people who have been forcibly evacuated from the cities. And the document states, the new people are experiencing shortages, shortages of food supplies as well as shortages of medication. Many people living west of Lavia and along the Stung Mongkol Bore stream have caught fever." Unquote. Note, Your Honours, that the document contains no specific order to ameliorate the situation, to help the people, to free them, so they can reunite with their families, grow their food and receive treatment. And of course, absolutely no discussion of allowing the people to return to their homes in the cities. Instead, enslavement is to continue despite the shortages and the illnesses. We anticipate that the defence will argue that this document shows that the leaders did seek to improve the people's livelihood. But what is clear is that any discussion of helping the slaves was directed solely at ensuring they are less likely to oppose the revolution. This is indicated in the following section of that document. And I quote, In order to be able 
to effectively defend the country, the issue of people's living standards and the cooperatives must be resolved. We are striving to sort things out for new people too, to make them satisfied with the revolution and make them see that this regime is one that belongs to them so that they no longer desire to go anywhere else." Your Honours, even in a passage in which the leaders are discussing the possibility of improving new people's living standards, they acknowledge that these people are their prisoners, their slaves, feed them so that they I quote, they no longer desire, desire to go anywhere else. But the leaders also make clear their continuing intent to persecute the new people. Let's look at another passage. And I quote, the function of cooperatives since the total liberation is to absorb all the new people coming out of all the cities and towns, especially Phnom Penh city and in the northwest Batamba. Every type of horrible element exists the, among the hundreds of thousands of new people in Batamba. But the cooperatives have absorbed them completely, supplying them with food and, moreover, deploying their strength to work. The power of the cooperatives is very mighty and indomitable." Unquote. Your Honours, this passage contains an important statement of criminal intent. First, the function of the cooperatives is to absorb, in other words, imprison the new people. Two, the new people as a group are to be subjugated because, I quote, every type of horrible element exists amongst them. And three, the new people are to be subjected to forced labour, deploy their strength to work. Unquote. In other words, the leaders are ex exercising and enforcing ownership over the bodies and lives of the evacuees, the very definition of Your Honours, this document corroborates the evidence we have been discussing over, over the last three days. There was in place a system that institutionalised persecution of the new people. These people were suppressed, confined to quarters and forced to perform hard labour, while searches continued for the bad elements among them, elements to be immediately eliminated. When Professor Chandler testified before you, Your Honours. We asked him to describe the purpose for the classification of people into new people and base people. He testified, and I quote, I think, quite easily, it was a way of defining the Cambodian population in terms of us and us and them the winners and the losers, basically the revolutionaries and the people they defeated. All of these were synonyms. The language offered in the Khmer Rouge period is singularly kind of soft or enigmatic, so they don't use these ferocious terms. They just say April the 17th or new, which are very bland terms. But I think everybody knew pretty fast that they weren't just new or April the 17th. They were targeted enemies, or they were able to be targeted if they made any missteps. They were being watched. They were not trusted." Unquote. Your Honours, Professor Chandler is making the obvious point 
that we submit is extremely important. One must not look simply at the words that are employed by the leaders. One must look at the system of terror and enslavement that they put in place. This is the context in which the Standing Committee determined by a simple decision that around half a million people should be moved to the northwest. And I'll quote, the labour force must be increased. Three or four hundred thousand more would not be enough. The current strength of one million persons can only work 50 per cent. It's imperative to add four or five hundred thousand more. Unquote. Your Honours, having seen the conditions in the North West, having acknowledged the evacuees were suffering from shortages and illnesses, having acknowledged that the existing population in the North West can perform work at only 50%. They decide to add another half a million. Not a word about providing sufficient food, water, medical aid or shelter for those about to be evacuated. Simply the decision to move them. As you have seen from my colleague's submission, the force movement resulted in death and suffering on a colossal scale. The standing, this standing committee meeting minutes also demonstrate that the searches for internal enemies continue to be a top priority for the leaders. The fact that people were trying to flee the slave camps meant, in the eyes of the Standing Committee, that there were still enemies to be identified and purged. And I quote, there exists within our ranks those who have not yet been purged. They make use of them to lead people to flee. We have been able to arrest them one after the other and are now continuing to search them out. Unquote. People are fleeing. There are enemies. We have arrested many. And we must continue to purge them. Your Honours, the defence will argue that neither Nguyen Chia or Khu Sampan had anything to do with this decision. It's true that Khu Sampan was out of the country in late August 1975 together with Yang Sari. They were on an important visit to China and Korea, securing the return of Prince Sihanouk to Cambodia. They returned on the 9th of September 1975. Nguyen Chia argues he did not take part in this trip to the northwest zone. He also makes the incredulous claim that the decision to transfer the people to the north and northwest was a decision made by the As we will see, the evidence proves otherwise. First of all, all members of the party centre, both Nguyen Chia and Khu Sampan, were aware of this decision. There is not a shred of evidence to suggest that they distanced themselves from it, questioned it, or sought to reverse it. Furthermore, they were leaders of the very system of enslavement and persecution within which this transfer took place. Their significant contribution is also recorded in the next document which I will discuss. Your Honours, the party centre's decision to carry out the second force, force transfer is recorded in a September, September 1975 document entitled Document No. 3, Examination of Control and Implementation of the Policy Line on Restoring the Economy and Preparations to Build the Country in Every Sector. For ease of reference, Your Honours, I'll refer to this as Document No. 3.
In his book, The Pol Pot Regime, Ben Kiernan dates this document at the 19th of September 1975. In other words, 10 days after Hu Sampan and Yang Sari had returned to the country. The full title of the document, number three, as well as its context, form and content, make it clear that the document issued collectively by the party centre. The document contains extensive discussions of several key policy issues, such as the absorption of the party line since the Central Committee meeting in May 1975, the imposition of a countrywide quota for rice production, the abolition of money, the construction of dams, and the forced movement of people between the zones. The document surveys the situation in the country and issues directives to zones, sectors and districts, as well as to ministries in Phnom Penh. No body, unit or organisation within the CPK other than the party centre had the authority to deal with matters of such breadth and importance. The fact that the document emanates from the party centre is corroborated by another piece of evidence. In a 1996 interview with Stephen Hedder, Yang Sari confirmed that it was in September ອັນນີ້ຄືບັນສໍາລະຈຸດຕະຫນຸນຄືບັນສໍາລະຈຸດຕະຫນຸນຄືບັນສໍາລະຈຫນຸນຄືບັນສໍາລະຈຸດຕ
indicated. Another section of document number three acknowledges that people are working 15 hours per day and this is having an impact on their health. The document then discusses forced movements of people to continue the forced labour programme. It states that forces of the people must be assembled, and I quote, wherever the soil is good, fertile and favourable, The goal to defend the country by exporting 2 million tonnes of rice during 1977 and 1980. As we will see, the party centre indeed proceeded to export rice and other produce generated through forced labour, even as their slaves were dying from starvation. Document number three then deals with the forced movements of its people. First, it directs Sector 15 of the West Zone to use 30,000 to 40,000 people to work on Highway 5. The leaders then move on to discuss the issue of the North and the North West, effectively ratifying the August 1975 Standing Committee decision, which we saw earlier. And I quote, In the North West, we must add an additional force of 500,000 people. Priya Vahir has requested 50,000 first. In Priya Vahir, there is the possibility of solving food supplies. Priya Vahir, there's 70,000 old people already, so send 20,000 first as we go along. In the north, they need people to be given to Kampong Tom province. The east also needs forces to be given to sectors which are short of people. So each zone must make appropriate preparations and not let things sway back and forth, allocating how many to upper level and moving how many to other locations." Unquote. In our submission, Your Honours, this passage of document number three is important for several reasons. First, it records a final collective decision by the party leadership, whose members included Nunchia and Kusampa, to forcibly move 500,000 people to the northwest and 20,000 people to the north. The Standing Committee, having made the August decision, only the party centre had the authority to deal with this matter further in September. There are a number of indicators of this fact that this was a centrally devised decision contrary to Nguyen submission. For example, the decision to transfer people to Priya Vahir was made in response to a request from the sector. Also, the document contains a directive to the zones with respect to movements of the people. They must not make things, I quote, sway back and forth, unquote. Another important feature of this document is it shows that the forced transfers are a core component of the party's ongoing enslavement program. Sector 15 to move 30,000 to 40,000 to new work sites, 20,000 people to be moved to Priya here, and 500,000 to the northwest. If I can take you to yet uh, another key feature of this document, number three, which shows in our submissions Q Sampan's involvement in the second force transfer. In our written brief, we discussed in detail Q Sampan's specific responsibilities for CPK's enslavement program. In sum, those responsibilities included distributing equipment within the country to ensure the implementation of the forced labour program, supervising the Ministry of Commerce, which exported thousands upon thousands of tonnes of rice delivered by the DK zones to the party centre.
As you have heard in testimonial evidence, Q Sampan regularly visited the state warehouses which stored this produce and gave instructions to the workers. In document number three, it makes reference to the involvement of the Ministry of Commerce in forced transfers of the population. And I quote, as for initiatives by state commerce, they are not up to par or even concerned about getting to up to par. Speaking about this, it's not that state commerce is not thinking. They think like they think of about transporting hundreds of thousands of people. But this is raised here for continued correction. Unquote. This is proof that the party centres forced transfers involved the Ministry of Commerce. In late 1975, that ministry was still part of the Grunk framework in which Q Sampan held the position of Deputy Prime Minister. Functionally, it was one of the ministries directly answerable to Q Sampan, Nguyen Chia, and the rest of the party centre. Your Honours, I would like to explore a few more documents in detail on this issue, and I see that it's approaching 12 o'clock, so I would uh, ask whether or not it's appropriate to take the break now. ពីនេះឬក៏អាចនឹងតទៅធានបទផ្សេងបាទបាទអរគុណលេខនេះដល់ពេលសម្រាក់ថ្ងៃត្រង់ហើយឲ្យមានប្រកាសសម្រាក់